Good morning, friends. Welcome to the worship of God at Wallingford Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you're here. We're glad that we're here together. Special welcome to those who will be catching our services on our YouTube channel. Friends, there's a black friendship pad somewhere on your row. Um, If you could find that and fill that out, uh, it's one of the ways that we get to see, uh, not really take attendance, just kind of get a feel for who's here. So that would be great if you could take the time to do that. Uh, Nathan is back from Ireland after his vacation in a church office. And I just wanted to, again, thank uh, Davis Pitcher for covering in a church office while Nathan was gone. And again, a teaser. Um, The staff decided we'd have a little more fun than we usually have and share some of our musical talent uh, with all of you. So on Wednesday, August the 21st, we'll be doing uh, a little musical review, Pastor Taylor and Lee and Leslie and Nathan and I are going to share um, some fun music with all of you. So if you've got nothing better to do on a Wednesday night, come on down. And if you have something better, tell us. Maybe we'll just do that instead. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much uh, it for the announcements. So. Helen, please lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We come as God's children, seeing the bread that gives me an everlasting life. Come, let us worship God together. And now is our time for young disciples, so I invite any children who are here this morning to meet me up front.
Hello, friend. Why don't you come on up with me? Hello. Hi, sweetie. You want to sit with me? Yeah? Or you can go there. I'm glad you're here. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Good? And also, yeah. yours, yours, yours sounded like a microphone that was very exotic. Mm hmm. You're right. Yeah, this microphone is a little bit willy nilly. Let's try that. Okay. All right. So, last week when we were here, we were talking about the names for God. There's so many different names for God. And if you weren't here last week, I was talking about nicknames. Raise your hand again if you have any kind of nickname. Yeah? I have a nickname. I'm, no, I'm sometimes not. Um, mm -hmm. um, like, are we doing like nickname names for like God? Yes. And last week, oh, you have a nickname? What's your nickname, honey? Oh, I love it. I love that. My, my nickname like, at the end of the school year was like, Rohan. Okay. My, my friends call me mm -hmm. Charlotte. Okay. Oh, that's good. Charlotte. Yeah? I got a for my mom and dad. Mm hmm. <laughs> Say hi to your mom. Okay. So let's look here on our big poster. These are the names for God. And last week we talked about some of them. But I remember last week there was one name you were really curious about, and I promised you we would get back to it. Can you say it real loud? One, two, three. Messiah, that's right. Good. So, I have some pictures. Can you guys look at the pictures for me? Let's look at these pictures together. This is from one of my children's Bibles. Who do you think this is? If you don't know his name, that's okay. What does it look like? It looks like Thor. But what's on his head? A crown. A crown. King, king of Thor. Thunder. The king of Thor. Yes. King of Thor. King, king, right? King Thor. Or some maybe it king kind of, of looks like royalty. Now, who is this? What do you think? Messiah. That is Messiah. Ooh, look closer. That is a queen of Sheba. It's a queen, that's right. And good reading. This is the queen. Of Sheba, right? And so both of those said queen of Sheba. look very fancy, right? It said Queen of Sheba. Yeah. Now I promise this is gonna relate back to the Messiah. Now look at our third picture. Who is this? Messiah. That is Messiah. That is. You're right, that is the Messiah. But what's not on his head? A crown, right? He doesn't have a crown on his head. He doesn't look fancy like the other royalty did in our other pictures. Our other pictures were Saul and Queen Sheba, but he is a different kind of king. So, the king of the world. Messiah was a word that meant the anointed one. The anointed one, which is when they would put oil on their foreheads to anoint someone to become king, right? So this means the, the anointed one. So when we call Jesus the Messiah, we're calling him our king, right? And so, but he's a different kind of king. He doesn't come with jewels or gold. He's the kind of king who has a kingdom that looks kingdom. different than any kingdom in this earth. <gasps> Look at that. I love that. What you can... is this? Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's one of God's names. That's Jesus' title, the Messiah, the anointed one, the king who is to come. So what we can learn from this today Messiah. is that we don't have to wait for him anymore. They waited and waited and waited for the king who was to come, the anointed one. But we have him, and he's in your hearts right now. He's our king, but he's a different kind of king, right? He's a king of love and the kind of king that you can talk to. What is that? So we can remember that this week. 
that we have a king of love who loves us for exactly as we are, right? And we can talk more about this story with him riding on a donkey as it gets closer to Easter. This is actually the day of Palm Sunday. So we'll talk about that again, okay? So remember that in the back of your mind. What is Palm Sunday? That was the day that he arrives into Jerusalem. And we'll talk about it more as it gets close because we're going to use props. You know, Pastor Taylor, I'm going to bring some props in to explain. So just don't forget, okay? Good. I think there is also an Easter pageant. Yes, that's right. We'll talk about it as we get closer to Easter. All right, so let's pray our Lord's Prayer together, okay? We can practice. And if you don't know the words, that's okay. All of our friends in the congregation can help us. All right, so let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Great job. Good listening. Thank you so much. Have fun in Sunday school. That's the song my mom and dad sing me before I go to school. Really? Sisters and brothers, siblings in the risen Christ, even our best intentions go awry when we are not at one with God's purposes. Our gracious God journeys with us and provides for us with unending mercy, patience, and kindness so that when we repent, we find ourselves forgiven. Let us confess our sin, confident in God's love for us. Living God, being together gives us time to reflect on our presence in your world. We confess that sometimes our forgiveness is not our gratitude for all gifts of freedom. When we do not live as neighbors, and anger controls our actions. When we walk away from our conversations, when we avoid our own guilt and fail to live up to the body of Christ. Forgive us, God, and help us. 
Renew our desire to live transformed by your love. Do not let us be defeated by our failures. And being honest with you, keep us from being disarmed and us. Renew us, God, and help us. Amen. God forgives us unconditionally. Through this gift of grace, may we have confidence to live transformed by God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, body of Christ, what shall we do in response to God's forgiveness? As God's own people, we will be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind, always ready to forgive as freely as God has forgiven us. And above everything else, we will be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for us. Please be seated. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word for the church today. Holy Spirit, come dwell with us and in us, that as we read and listen to God's word, we might be blessed with understanding. Amen. Our first reading is a reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4 verses 25 through verse 2 of chapter 5. I invite you to listen to the word of God. So then, putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Our next scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to John, selected verses from chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? 
How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So tonight uh, are the closing ceremonies of the Olympic Games, and last week I started my sermon by asking if you'd been watching, and most of you raised your hands, and this week I'm going to get back to that, but at the end of, of the sermon. But for now, let's get back to where we left off in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the will of God and the rules of God. For those of you who weren't here last week, we ended by reflecting on the difference between the will of God, that is, that we should love one another, created in God's image, as we all are, and the rule of God, which is what we need in order to get to the will of God, because, as Calvin put it, we are totally depraved, meaning not so much that we are just awful to the core, but that we really can't get to the will of God on our own. There is nothing we can do to merit God's love. We need God's grace through Jesus Christ to get to the will of God. So, rules or as Paul sometimes put it in his letters, the law. Let's talk about the rules today. Who likes rules? Not quite as many people like rules as watch the Olympics, clearly. (laughs) When we're young, we rebel against them. And sometimes when we're old, We wonder why people aren't paying more attention to them. Like stop signs. Is it yield or is it stop? Well, if you're the oldest child, you usually follow them. If you're the middle child, you really push against them. And if you're the youngest child, by the time your two older siblings have come along, your parents are so tired of fighting with you that you pretty much get away with everything. Rebelling is what we do as human beings because when we are young, whether we're young as humanity or as individuals, rules are a pain, and we're pretty sure that they are meant to be broken. And you know what? Some of them are supposed to be broken. And even Jesus was a rule breaker. And some of the rules that are imposed on our society are just that, imposed by the society. Frederick Buechner shares this bit of wisdom. It is no secret that ideas about what is right and what is wrong vary from time to time and place to place. King Solomon would not be apt to see eye to eye with a Presbyterian missionary on the subject of monogamy. For that reason, a popular argument runs, morality is all relative to the tastes of the time and not to be taken any more seriously by the enlightened than tastes in food and dress and architecture or anything else. At a certain level, this is indisputably so. 
But there is another level. In order to be healthy, there are certain rules you can break only at your peril. Eat sensibly, get enough sleep and exercise, avoid bottles marked poison, don't jump out of boats unless you can swim, and so on. In order to be happy, there are also certain rules you can break only at your peril. Be at peace with your neighbor. Get rid of hatred and envy. Tell the truth. Avoid temptations to evil you are not strong enough to resist. Don't murder, steal, and so on. He continues, both sets of rules are as valid as a third sent to a... Both sets of rules are as valid for a third century person as for a 20th century Norwegian, for a Muslim as for a Methodist bishop, for the Emperor Nero as for Marilyn Monroe. Both sets of rules, the moral as well as the hygienic, describe not the way people feel life ought to be, but the way they have found life is. I was struck by what he said about in order to be happy. What are the things that we think of as the things that will lead to our happiness? In order to be happy, there are certain rules you can break only at your peril. So the first set of rules for us as disciples of Jesus Christ are the Ten Commandments. They're direct and to the point, and every society or social construct would do well to live by them if they're going to get along. Paul fleshes the rules out for his ears, and it's not rocket science, as they say. There's nothing Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus that should surprise us. We know the golden rule, and even people who are unchurched have heard at one point or another that love is expressed through action, and to live in society means living with a certain amount of rules so that society can function in a civil and orderly manner. As Jesus said, and as Pastor Taylor shared with us a few weeks ago, it's not what goes into the mouth that is important, it is what comes out of it. Not rocket science, but Paul seems to feel that he needs to be clearer. Why? Well, maybe because the Christians in Ephesus are human beings. And although we all understand what Jesus said, it is another thing altogether to do what Jesus says. Seriously, though. What must have been going on in emphasis that Paul feels a need to be so explicit in what he writes to them? Don't steal, don't speak evil to one another, don't stay angry, put away your bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all your malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. Boy, if I didn't know any better, I would think that Ephesus was in the middle of a political campaign. Paul not only understood but also experienced that we are often much too quick to judge. We focus on surface differences and miss the matters of the heart. I love my granddaughters. I will lead with that. And when they were teenagers, I remember walking through the mall with them when we still had indoor malls. And I would look at them, and they could look at someone, especially another girl, and make a decision about them in less than three seconds. Their eyes started at the top, worked their way down to the toes, and in three seconds' time, they pretty much knew where the girl had purchased her clothes, made a judgment on what kind of person she was, goth, emo, hipster, punker, popular girl, man, nerd, rapper, all this without saying a word. I don't know, do we still do that? Of course we do. Now, we older folks are just not as fast as we used to be, but our judgments tend to run deeper and are so much more solidified. 
We see someone at work or meet someone on the street or even here at church, and the voices in our head go off, categorizing, making judgments, decisions on who they might be, just on what we can see and even what we don't see. Now, we don't have to see folks thanks to Facebook and various other social media anymore. Now we can judge through the internet. And through a slogan, a bumper sticker statement, even just the name of the candidate they support on a sign on the front lawn of their house. Let me tell you a story. And I've told you this one before, but it's a good story. And as my mother-in-law would say, I know you've heard it before, but I like to tell it. <laughs> Cindy and I were on vacation and I decided to get my ear pierced. I, I wore my earring today just so you see that I wasn't kidding. And why did I get it? Well, maybe because I'm a sailor at heart and sailors do that sort of thing, or maybe because I, I was chasing my youth because I was 40 years old when I did it. Or maybe because I can be a little passive aggressive sometimes, as my oldest daughter tells me, and wanted to see how the members of the congregation I was serving would react. Because pastors, you see, do that sort of thing sometimes. Well, most members didn't say much, but a few were really mad at me. I no longer matched the image they had of what a minister should look like, how they should behave. Ministers don't wear earrings, at least not at my age. My point, of course, is that I had not fundamentally changed by having my ear pierced, my heart was the same, but the members who had a set image of me had to readjust their prejudice of who wore earrings, what kind of person wears such a thing. The gospel story of Jesus going back home. First, he's received with, wow, who is this guy? He's terrific. And then, wait a minute, isn't that Mary's son, the carpenter? Thank God that has changed. At least, I hope it has. Let me tell you another story. And again, I've told you this story before, but it's a good one. <laughs> Fred Craddock, former preaching professor, tells the story of his first call. He was a pastor in the Disciples of Christ. Church of Christ, tells the story of his first call out of seminary to a little church in eastern Tennessee. The community was in transition because of the building of an atomic power station, nuclear power station. There were lots of transient and influx of people in the town, and a number of trailer parks sprang up around the once quiet little town. And he said, hey, we need to launch a calling campaign. And they responded that they didn't think those kind of people would fit in with their church. But it was agreed that they would pray about it and meet the following week to make a final decision. So the following Sunday, Fred opened a meeting with prayer and immediately one of the elders moved that only people who own property in the community could be members of the church. It was seconded, the motion was passed by the governing board. Years later, Fred, now married, wanted to show his wife where his ministry started. They found the old church, and much to his surprise, the parking lot was full. Cars, trucks, motorcycles. And out front, a big sign that read, Barbecue, all you can eat. The church was now a restaurant. The pews pushed to the sides. The little organ no longer played. And Fred reflects, people everywhere sitting there eating barbecued pork and chicken and ribs, all kinds of people. I said to Nettie, it's a good thing this is not a little church. Otherwise, these people couldn't be here. Friends, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for not being like that. Through the years, you have been open and welcoming 
And I know you members who've been around here for a while have the stripes to show for that movement towards openness and welcome. But friends, we will not be serving barbecue here for a long time. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. It may not be rocket science how we're called to live with one another, the rules that make for right and loving living, but it is an earth-shattering truth, one we all know in our hearts and one that we would often prefer to ignore. What we say, what we do, how we treat one another, especially in the community of the church, matters. God's rules are important. They lead to God's will of grace and love. And God knows we need them. You know, a river flows because it has banks on either side. Without banks, a river becomes a swamp. Let me tell you another story. A man was approached by a traveling evangelist and asked if he was saved. The man looked at the preacher and said nothing. Instead, he reached into his pocket and he took out a small notebook and a pen and silently he wrote a few things in a notebook, ripped out the page that he had scribbled on and he said, here, as he handed the paper to the evangelist. Here are the names of a few family members and neighbors and members of the church I attend. Ask them if I am saved. So have you been watching the Olympics? <laughs> and last week I asked you what you liked about the Olympics, and you told me, and we're, we're pretty much all on the same page. The camaraderie, the, the, the joy, the excitement, um, but most of all, this understanding, bless you, uh, but most of all, the understanding that they got there because they were part of a community that supported them. And isn't it great to see how they respected one another, take the time to hug and shake hands, medal winners and those who didn't get the gold or the silver or the bronze. Can you imagine seeing some of these events live, being part of that crowd, seeing what's taking place right in front of your eyes, being in the stands as history unfolds before your eyes. Did any of you jump like me, jump up at one point or another to find your heart racing with anticipation or hold your breath at the finish for a race? Yes? yes. Thank you. You're alive. It's really exciting to be able to watch these athletes put it all on the field or the track or the pool. Years of work and dedication to their sport. The sacrifices they made, their families made, their friends made for the sake of accomplishing this personal goal. You know, I wasn't always 68 years old and 20 pounds too heavy. There was a time when I dedicated myself to certain sports, not the Olympic level, judo, cycling, racquetball. And for me, just being good enough to make the Olympics would be winning. But here's my point. As thrilling as it has been to watch the Olympics, as thrilling as it would have been to be there to watch the events in person, I am still a spectator. And that is a far cry from actually participating as a participant in the Olympics. Stick with me. God's will for us Jesus' command that we love one another, Paul's fleshing out the rules, is all about our being participants in the will of God. Friends, Jesus is calling, and he's calling for you to get out of the stands and onto the field and be a participant in his will, no longer a spectator on the sideline. And I will meet you there. And speaking of meeting you there, there's an invitation to discipleship in the bulletin, and it reads, Friends, Christ gave a variety of gifts to the people of God, each unique, each needed, each beloved. Christ invites us to use our gifts, joined and knit together by every ligament for the service of the whole body as it grows together, building itself up in love. If you feel the Spirit calling, 
I invite you to join the membership of this congregation and walk with us as we strive to build one another up in love. Amen. Amen. And amen. Through Jesus, God gives us every spiritual gift and a glorious vision of the fullness of time. Come, people of God, let us offer our gifts to God. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive the morning offering. Please join me as we dedicate our offering. Wise and wonderful God, who long defines our lives, giving shape and direction to our days, accept these gifts pray, and give us one thing more. Live according to the graceful, challenging, and exhilarating rule of your love. Amen. You may be seated.
friends, now we'll enter into a time of prayer. Let's go before God. Lord of our life, we know you are always with us in every moment of every day. And our every days are filled with laughter and sadness, joy, sorrow, fear. And so we bring our every days before you now. Lord, we also bring before you those who are in need of your special care. Be with those who are sick and injured, those in need of surgery, those with cancer, those who are struggling with mental illness or addiction. May your presence be with them and give them your healing touch in body, mind, and spirit to be made strong in you. Lord, bless those who are caretakers, those who grieve, those who are hungry. Lord, offer them your provision, your comfort, your rest, and teach us how to be your hands and feet so that we might show your love to them. Bless the victims of war all across the world, in Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. Bless those who are affected by gun violence. Bless all those who are active duty, reserves, and veterans of our armed forces. And now, Lord, we offer to you the prayers of our secret heart, knowing that you lovingly hear us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We offer all of this up to you in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and join us for our closing hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
So friends, let us go from this place to walk with God in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called, in all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and speaking the truth in love. May God, the source of all life, energize you with the Spirit, the power of all life, and fill you with Christ, the bread of life, that you may receive life and live it abundantly. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's go have some goodies and coffee and cookies. <laughs>